the random matrix part. So again, the idea is to, uh, is to study, uh, to present you another uh, example of uh, extreme statistics for strongly correlated system, which, uh, as we will see, um, partly today or maybe a little bit late, uh, on Monday, uh, has actually many very nice applications, um, which is the, the essentially the, the, the problem of studying the largest eigenvalue of random matrices, so largest real eigenvalues if the, the, the matrices uh, have some special symmetry. More generically, uh, the study of uh, the, the, the eigenvalues uh, of highest, of, of largest modulus, if you deal with uh, non-emission, for instance, uh, random matrices. And um, I started with um, a simple example to just give you some motivation and show you how this question of largest eigenvalue naturally arises in some simple model. And uh, I chose to present this uh, model introduced by May, which is at the end boils down to this uh, sort of dynamical, uh, dynamical system. So you have uh, X size basically measures the, so you suppose that you have a, a species of certain density, rho i, and uh, you say that, okay, I mean, uh, uh, they, in the absence of any interactions, they actually form a stable system. And uh, that means that their density is typically uh, given by a rho i star, some equilibrium density. And then you want to measure the fluctuations or the distance from this initial density when you slightly perturb the system. Now, uh, you make the assumption that in the absence of, inter of interactions, essentially your system is, very, is, is, is pretty much stable. And uh, that means that all the, uh, the, 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 the species, all the densities will slowly, I mean, not slowly, in fact, exponentially relax uh, to, their, um, to their equilibrium value. Another question that, uh, that, that one may ask uh, is uh, what happens if you switch on interaction? Okay? So again, we model this interaction by this random matrix because we estimate that the system is quite complex and, and also quite big enough. And, uh, you ask again this question, uh, which is what's the probability that the system remains stable as a function of alpha? So we know that if alpha is zero, this probability is just one. So that's basically this, uh, this case here. Okay, so one of, I plot it as a function as a one over alpha. And then uh, what May observed is that uh, if you increase the, uh, the interaction, and when n is large, then suddenly what, what you see is that uh, there is a rather sudden transition between a stable phase and an unstable phase as you cross some critical value WC. Okay, so that means that if, w, if alpha is uh, large enough, then with probability one, your system will be unstable, or probability zero, the system will be stable. Okay? Then this, of course, happens only in the limit when n goes to infinity. And you see that uh, this has the feature, this has the, the the, the, yeah, the feature of some uh, uh, phase transition, and what you would like to understand is uh, what is this transition, okay? What kind of transition is that? Now, of course, uh, well, to study that, it's not of course, but uh, what I showed you is that uh, there is, in fact, a very nice uh, connection between this uh, uh, probability of stability and the cumulative probability of the largest eigenvalue of uh, a set, some, some set of random matrices. Okay, so namely, uh, if you consider this case, the, the, for, for, for this situation, if you consider the case of uh, Gaussian orthogonal matrices, that means basically you just take uh, real symmetric matrices and you fill it uh, with uh, random numbers which are taken from uh, Gaussian uh, distributions, you, they are IID, except that they need to, uh, of course, respect this constraint of uh, symmetric uh, matrices, so um, as we discussed yesterday. Uh, so basically, the, the, the problem boils down to study the distribution of the largest eigenvalue of this set of random matrices. Now, uh, these uh, GOE type of uh, matrices have been widely studied, I mentioned yesterday, in various contexts, starting uh, from the, the, the the, the, uh, the realm of uh, nuclear physics. I will not enter too much in these historical details. That's not my purpose here. But I just wanted, I just first showed you that uh, if you look at the, the, the distribution of, the, of this matrix, so think that now you, have to, you want to, to put some probability measure on the set of your matrices, 
and you can do that easily by just setting some uh, measures on the on these GIs. Then eventually you get this uh, kind of Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's a sort of uh, Gaussian measure, but generalized uh, to the case of matrices. You know, I mean, you have this trace of J square, you have this quadratic uh, term, and it turns out that you can actually write explicitly the joint law of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, so I remind you that. This matrix being symmetric, real symmetric, its eigenvalues are, of course, real, all real. And uh, you see that uh, there is this, uh, you, you have this explicit, uh, this explicit uh, expression. Uh, so let's uh, just, uh, so the case that, um, that we need to study here, in principle, is the case B corresponds to beta equal to 1. So you have an explicit expression, okay? So you have this product of Gaussians, which essentially comes from this term here. And uh, you have an additional term, uh, which is this van der Monde, uh, term, um, which actually corresponds to, uh, uh, again, this change of variable when you initially have the set of uh, matrix elements and when you switch on to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so there will be a Jacobian when you compute the, um, the probability measure. And this Jacobian gives rise to this non-trivial term. Now, I put a beta here because the case that we are studying is actually beta equal 1, but there is, in principle, you, one can study these models for any beta. And in particular, there are three values of beta which are singular in this, uh, uh, in this, in this context. Beta equal 1, I already discussed it. Beta equal 2 is actually the case of, uh, instead of having real symmetric matrix, uh, you take a complex emission. Okay, so, so you put, again, uh, a matrix which is emission, and you put just real and uh, complex uh, parts uh, as are IID uh, Gaussian random variables. You need to respect the constraints that your matrix has to be Hermitian. And then again, because it's Hermitian, you would have uh, um, real eigenvalues, and that's what uh, you get. You can have uh, other values of beta. I mentioned beta equal 4, which corresponds to this Gaussian symplectic ensemble, which I will not discuss here. Uh, now, it turns out that one can also give uh, meaning to any values of beta. But this is also a little bit more technical, uh, and I will not enter too much into the details. But still, uh, I want to uh, focus on, on, this, on this part here. And uh, again, tells you that you immediately see that uh, because of this term here, uh, you have actually a strong uh, correlation between, between these lambda i's. Okay? So that means that if I, would have, if I had only this product of Gaussians, then obviously that there would be IID. But because of this term, you see that they are interacting. And in fact, they are interacting in such a way that because of this term, you see that two eigenvalues don't want to sit very close together. OK, because you see that uh, if lambda i is very close to lambda j, then this term will be very small, and the probability of such configuration will be extremely small. OK, so this is called level repulsion. OK, so that means that the eigenvalues of, this, uh, of such random matrices, they really don't like to sit uh, very much, I mean, close by. Okay, now, and this is uh, why this is an, uh, an interacting uh, set uh, of random variables. Now, it turns out that although it, in principle here, uh, comes out from a rather mathematical way, now if you think about this, 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 this joint law, it has actually a very nice uh, physical interpretation. And it has actually a physical interpretation in terms of what, what I would like to call here a Coulomb gas. So what is it about? Well, the idea is relatively simple. And basically, this idea is U to Dyson, the same as the Schwinger Dyson. So this, uh, uh, di I mean, what, what, you, what, what you can realize is that you see, I mean, this product here. So let's write it in a slightly different way. So I will just use this uh, stupid identity. Uh, which is that uh, x uh, to the power of beta is just exponential of beta log x. I'm sure you will agree with this, uh, with this uh, identity. <coughs> and so I will apply it to that. So let's write it this way. So I, just, I will just have this. So I have a product of, this, of, such, uh, of such terms here, which we, each of them I will rewrite it in this way. Now, the product of exponential is just the exponential of the sum. So I will just write it like this. And I will write it as exponential of beta 
sum from i less than j log of lambda i minus lambda j minus n over 2 beta sum over i lambda i square. That fine? So, okay, for convenience, I prefer to, uh, to symmetrize this a little bit, I, and I will just rewrite it as the sum over all ij's, but then I need to have a factor of 2 here. Is that fine? So now, uh, what I want to, to emphasize is that I can interpret this joint law as uh, Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann weight associated to a set of particles which are sitting in a quadratic potential and interacting via this logarithmic, logarithmic potential, repulsive rep logarithmic potential. Okay? So that means that I will write this as exponential of minus beta times some function of the lambda i's. Sorry? Ah, yeah, okay. It's because you see here, I mean, the convention, the standard convention is to, is to have i strictly smaller than j. But, okay, I prefer to have the, 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 the full sum of i and j unrestricted. But then I will count i less than j and i bigger than j. And since they are the same, I will just count it with a factor half. Why is it okay? Why is it so? Why they are the same? I, because they are because the, 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 the absolute value here is symmetric. Okay, this guy, I, I could also write it as lambda j minus lambda i. Is it okay? Okay, so if you don't like it, I mean, you can just, just say with that, I will, okay, will, will not. It's just because, okay, that's the standard way I, I work with that, and so, in my notes, it's like this. <laughs> and because, OK, usually I, I do something else with that, and uh, it's much better to have a symmetric uh, expression. Today, I will not use that. So if you don't like it, uh, don't use it. OK, so now what is this E? So again, it has the, the form of, uh, of uh, a Boltzmann weight. So this beta now, you see, I mean, it plays the role of an inverse temperature. That's why I called it beta. I mean, it's not me who called it beta, by the way. And so what is E? So E So there are two components, two parts. There is the first part which has to do with the uh, interaction. And then I have a confining potential. Okay. So I have n over 2 sum over lambda square. OK, maybe just to un finish to answer your question. I mean, when you really want to, to, to do computations with that, it's nice to have a half here because I have a half there. I mean, this is just the idea. Just to simplify a bit the, the calculations. OK, so now you see that I have two parts again. So that means that I can interpret this. Uh, this lambda i's as the positions of some particles. Okay, so these are my eigenvalues. In principle, purely mathematical objects. But in fact, I want to interpret them as uh, okay as the position of some particles. Now. Because of this term here, that means that they are they live actually in a confining potential, okay, quadratic uh, potential, so they are confined. Okay, so that's basically the, this term here. So it's n over two uh, lambda square. And so, for that reason, of course, they would prefer to stay 
all of them uh, in the center of the trap. But it turns out that because of this level, rep this level repulsion that I mentioned before, so they don't like to sit close by, there is this logarithmic interaction term. Okay? So these particles actually are uh, interacting via uh, repulsive interaction. So it's a logarithmic repulsive interaction. So at the end, uh, this problem of random matrices, which in fact, in principle, is a purely mathematical problem, now becomes a problem of statistical mechanics, which is a problem of studying particles confined in a trap and uh, interacting via long-range interactions. Okay, logarithmic repulsive interactions. So that's actually the, and that's how certainly uh, many uh, physicists then have contributed to to to, to this field, uh, is that you see that uh, this principle purely mathematical problem have a very nice and direct uh, interpretation in terms of a statistical mechanics problem. So now, uh, why Coulomb gas? Uh, well, gas is clear. Just we have a gas of particles. Now, why Coulomb? Why Coulomb? Because this logarithmic uh, potential uh, corresponds to the Coulomb interaction in two dimensions. Okay? So if you solve the Poisson equation, if you look at the what kind of, uh, what is the, 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 the nature of the uh, Coulomb interactions, then you would find, of course, that uh, in 3D, I mean, that you know, I mean, the, 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 the interaction is like 1 over R. Then if you look at, uh, for the potential is 1 over R. Uh, in 2D, this is logarithmic. And in 1D, this is linear. Now here, uh, we have the logarithmic uh, potential. So this logarithmic potential is like the 2D Coulomb interaction. So in other words, that's why it's called Coulomb gas. And uh, now the, the concrete physical, uh, I mean, the more concrete physical uh, realization is that, OK, you take these particles, which uh, in principle would like to live in the plane. And they would then, uh, they are, these are charges. They, are, they have all the same sign. OK, you are only, only have plus or only minus charges here. So it's a one component uh, plus minus in some sense. And uh, they are repulsive, uh, repulsively interacting, and they are confined to stay on the line and fill this, uh, uh, this confining potential. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a very nice interpretation, and which then opens the way to use the standard tools of statistical mechanics. Is that fine? Yeah. It's yeah, it's completely classical. So it's a classical system, yeah. Absolutely. So the, the, it's a classical picture. Turns out that you can give a completely different interpretation of this joint law in terms of a quantum system. In fact, in terms of free fermions, very similar to what uh, Maurizio has been discussing in, in, in the early set uh, of, this, of his lectures. But I will not enter too much into that. So what I'm saying is that this p-joint can be interpreted as the modular square of some wave function of a multi-particle system. But this is yet something else, uh, which I, okay, which I could discuss if you want, but which is not really the topic of uh, of this lecture. So I would prefer we can discuss in private. But uh, so let's stick to this to this uh, to this picture now, <coughs> classical picture indeed, and let's try to understand what what is happening. So first, you see that uh, if you think a little bit about these two terms, uh, there is one uh, that really wants to, to confine all the particles uh, in the center. So if it, there were only this term here, all the particle in the ground state or in the, at equilibrium somehow, the, 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 the state with uh, lowest energy would correspond to uh, having all the particles just sitting at zero in the center of the trap. But on the other hand, because of these interactions, they cannot do that. So there is a, a competition between these two terms. And as a matter of fact, uh, so maybe one, can, one could also uh, consider the, the other case. That means, suppose that you don't have any confining. If I have only the repulsive interactions, then the particle would like to be very far from each other, and the density will be spread out along all the real lines. Okay, so you have a competition between this term, who would like to have all the particles uh, uh, at zero in the middle of the trap, this one who would like to have all the particles spread over the, all the real line. And as a matter of, uh, I mean, as a result of competition between these two terms, what will happen is that the density actually has a finite support. 
Okay, so that means that what we will see is that uh, the competition between, so there is a competition between uh, repulsion and, and trapping potential, between uh, repulsion and uh, the trapping potential, uh, essentially uh, will uh, lead to the fact that if you look at the density, so we will see that in a minute. If I look at the density of particles, I will be more, a little bit more, uh, much more precise in a minute. But if you look at the density of particles as a function of lambda, uh, what you will see is that it's actually confined here. And uh, so it's symmetric because, yeah, you see that the, um, the Boltzmann wane is completely symmetric when you change lambda in minus lambda. So the density itself will be symmetric, but there will be a finite support. And in fact, the values I can already tell, to tell you, this is square root of two and minus square root of two. And this is related to this critical value that I mentioned yesterday for the maze model. I told you that the WC is one over square root of two. Well, this square root of two is here. We will see why. Okay, so, okay, this number uh, doesn't really matter. I just want to, uh, uh, to insist on the fact that the competition of these two things to this uh, two types of uh, energy uh, will lead to confinement. So before, before uh, giving you the explicit form of this, which is quite simple, uh, what we would like to do, so since I'm saying that here um, there is indeed uh, some uh, confinement, I was already telling you here on this that the, the segment or the typical value is of order one. I want to show you that, so I want to estimate the typical, uh, the typical value of the, of the lambda i's. Okay, so that means where, I mean, if I look at, so suppose that I have this kind of interactions, then if I look at the one of these charge, what is this typical value as a function of n? Is it something that grows with n? Is it something that decreases with n? And if it grows or decreases, uh, with which power or how, how does it behave with n? Okay, so that's what I want to estimate. Yeah? Right. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that, that's, what, that, that's what happens precisely, yeah. So the density is higher there, and if you go there, really, I mean, the density is very small, and will be also much more sensitive to fluctuations. Yes, that's what happens. So let's try to estimate the typical value of lambda. So to estimate it, uh, I will do the standard uh, heuristic argument. Of course, it's, it's just an estimate. And I will see that uh, at equilibrium, as I already anticipated, uh, these two uh, energies, interactions energy, confining potential energies, should be of the same order. Okay, so that's how I will basically estimate uh, this, uh, this term here. So let's uh, try to... Uh, estimate the potential energy, uh, which is n over 2, uh, sum from 1 to n of lambda i squared. Then this, OK, I mean, if I am saying that there is a typical scale for lambda i, then that should be of the order of n over 2, sum from 1 i equal to n. So I will say that uh, this lambda i squared is typically lambda typical square. And this is, we have n terms here. So n times n times n, so it means n squared. So that means that I have something which scales like n squared over 2 times lambda squared typical. OK? So that's the, uh, the first estimate. Now let's do the same for this term here, for the interaction energy. Yeah. Well, I'm saying that most of them, at least a macroscopic part of it, have the same scale, yes. <coughs> of course, not all the spectrum actually have this, 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 uh, this not, not all of them. This is the typical, right? So 
that, that means that most, that, that's what I mean by typical. Okay, so most of them, a large fraction, the macroscopic fraction of these, of these, uh, of these uh, eigenvalues have the same, the same, the same value. Not the same value, but the same scale with them. Okay. So again, that means that, okay, if you want to do it more carefully, you will write that lambda i is basically some scale here times uh, mu i, if you want. Okay, now this guy is of order one, and lambda typical might be whatever you are, you are after. Okay? Again, it's a heuristic argument, right? There is a fully rigorous way to do that. But let's, let's go for a heuristic argument to try to estimate things. You can compute this exactly if you want. I mean, there are many tools. Uh, but let's try to, to just get the, 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 the scale. Again, that's how a physicist should, uh, should try to, to, to look at these models first. So if I look at this, at this then you see that it's almost a, a, a dimensional analysis. But uh, this log here, when you have a typical scale here, this log here will be typically of order 1. Okay. Okay, the log is, is, a, is just a number. It doesn't have any scale with n. And so that means that to estimate the scale of it, you need to count the number of terms that you have here. Okay. Now, the number of terms that you have here is just n, n minus 1 over 2. Okay. And for large n, this is just n squared, or minus n squared over 4. Okay. So I can do that because I have a log, right? Suppose that I, if I had something like uh, this absolute value, for instance, in one dimension, which would be the Coulomb uh, interaction in one dimension, then of course I would say that this typically is of order lambda typical. But because of this log here, this is just simply of order one. Of order one or something which has some logarithmic correction in, 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 in lambda typical, which at this level don't really matter. So if you balance this, uh, these two terms here, well, you see that, uh, so now if you say that the potential energy is like uh, the interaction energy, okay, if you assume that this minimization profile results from this competition, and which is something uh, which indeed happens, otherwise you would have, as I said, this is the only way to have a non-trivial physics, by the way. Otherwise, uh, either they are very strongly interacting and uh, you don't see them and they, they are completely widespread. Otherwise, they are not interacting at all and the physics is also a bit trivial. But if you do that, then you see that you need to have n squared over 2 lambda typical square should be of order n squared over 4. Okay? So if you forget about the factors, because, uh, they, 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 of course, this this is uh, this is this will not allow you to get the correct refactors here. But what you see, what what it tells you is that lambda typical is of order one. So that's a bit related to uh, what we were discussing uh, last time uh, when I was uh, mentioning that to get this this measure here, you need to have a variance which is proportional to one over n. Then you see, of course, that if I suppose that uh, I take my random matrices, which have uh, Gaussian with a variance of order 1, then here you would have something of order 1 here. And then, of course, the scaling will be different, and the scaling will be square root of n. Okay, so it's clear that this estimate needs to be redone at each time that you, that you are really fixing the scales. They depend pretty much on how much you, you, I mean, how the coefficients here, either the confining potential, either the strengths of your interaction do scale with n. But you see that it's fairly standard, and actually, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's this heuristic argument. I mean, I don't know any example where this uh, heuristic argument uh, does not predict correctly the, the, the scale of the, of, the, of the lambdas. Okay, so that's extremely powerful. Okay? <laughs> so that tells you indeed that this lambda is actually typically of order one. Now, what is the density? Well, the density can be computed. There are many ways to do that. Um, various methods. 
one would use, would use this uh, Coulomb gas approach associated coupled to a, uh, to a kind of uh, saddle point calculation. Other methods would involve, uh, for instance, uh, orthogonal polynomials, I mean, which are actually extremely useful for random matrices. I will not do that here, I will just show you the result. So the density, the density, uh, okay, let's keep this, uh, this in mind. So if I want to compute the average density, so what is the average density? So uh, for rho n, so I, I would define rho n, uh, which would be this quantity here, okay? So And I take the average over that. Okay? So that's the definition of my density, the average density. So now the average that I take here is with, with respect to this Boltzmann weight. Okay? So that's uh, with respect to uh, 1 over z, z prime n. I really compute as I would do in uh, standard statistical mechanics. Now you can almost forget that. Uh, but if you, if you don't like matrices, then you can just think it, uh, think about it in terms of uh, Coulomb gas, Coulomb gas picture. Okay, so you have this computation to do. It's not a completely obvious computation to to, to do, but uh, wh what happens is that uh, when you do the limit of large n, again, I'm not doing, uh, I'm doing the things very quick. Qualitate, not qualitatively, but at least I, I don't have really time to enter into the details. I'm not doing a course on RMT. I just want to go rather fast to the, to the largest eigenvalues. Okay. So what is, uh, what is the, 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 limiting, the limiting form? Well, the density is, is known uh, under uh, the Wigner semicircle. So it converges to uh, some function which is independent of n. So that's That is expected because we already know that the typical scale will be of order one. So one should expect that this simply goes uh, to something which is well defined as a function of n. And this rho of w, uh, I'm sure you have already seen it, is this, has this form. So remarkably, it has a finite support. And it's given by this, uh, by this uh, semicircle. Okay, so this is called the Wigner semicircle. So this is, of course, true for lambda less than square root of 2. And this is uh, the Wigner semicircle. OK? So it, if you think a little bit about it, it's not completely trivial that it has really a finite support. Because of course, for finite n, there will be particles everywhere. OK? And only in the large end uh, limit, it becomes completely finite. Okay. But one has to, maybe I, I should comment on that. <clears throat> if you look at how the, sorry. So this is the large end limit. So that gives you the, the density of particles. But of course, if you run a simulation, for instance, and if you have, I don't know, 1,000 or 10,000 particles, uh, for n large but finite, it's a remark, uh, but uh, the, the density actually will be more like that. Okay, so you have your limit limiting form. So that's the Wigner semicircle. And in fact, uh, what will happen is that, so here I have square root of 2, here I have minus square root of 2. Okay, then if you look at the density, uh, well, here it will be very close to, uh, to what it is. But then, of course, here it will be rounded up, smeared out. Okay, so you will have, uh, so that's the finite end results. Of course, you know, I'm sort of exaggerating a little bit uh, because, in fact, it's really tiny. Um, that's the finite end results. So finite end. Uh, what I'm saying is that, of course, uh, there will be some particles which are far away from square root of 2. 
but the probability that this uh, happens actually goes to zero when n goes to infinity. But nevertheless, there will be some. OK? So now what I would like to study is the, uh, now I come to the, to, 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 to the main point of, of, of what I, I want to study is the, uh, the largest eigenvalue. OK, so that's more or less what you need to know about this RNT, uh, just, to, just to know uh, and to understand a bit or appreciate a bit uh, the extreme statistics of this, uh, of this uh, largest eigenvalue. OK, so. So let's go. And let's try again to let's try to, to, to know to apply what we know to this rather complicated problem. So what do I mean by that? Is that okay? So now I come to this uh, to the largest eigenvalue. Because now that I know the density, so once there is something that one must probably uh, has, has to appreciate is that uh, is the meaning of the density. So the density, you see, okay, I define it as the, the mean density, of, I mean, the, the average density of particles. Now, it has also a slightly different meaning, which is suppose that uh, you are looking at these uh, eigenvalues. And if you ask what's the probability to find a particle in, say, lambda, then the, pro the PDF of a single eigenvalue is precisely the density. OK, so that's something that uh, one should appreciate, uh, is that I will come back to that. So I want to, I want to look at this, at this guy. Now the remark that I did is that okay, we have seen. I think this this is clear. I mean the way it's it's defined. I mean this this is fine. It's the limit for large n of this object. So that's the density. But it has also I can also view it. It's equivalent, but it's not always very clear to everyone that this is just the PDF of lambda i. Of any lambda i. Of course, they are they play an identical role. I mean, if you look at the joint law, joint law for, of the lambda i's is completely symmetric under any permutation of these lambda i's. So they all behave in the same way, statistically. But now, if uh, if I look at this, uh, well, the PDF of, of of any eigenvalue. Let's let's go in this way. Let's write it in this way. Okay. It's a one point sometime, okay. People would call it a one point function. Yeah. Fine. So now we know quite a few things. We know that the density here has this kind of, of uh, variables. Okay. So let's, for a moment, uh, forget about, we know that they are correlated, these variables. Let's try to see uh, what we can get if we forget about the the fact that they are correlated, and just let's try to apply what we know from the, uh, the theory of IID random variables. So let's, for a while, and let's see how, 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 far, how far we can go. And okay, at some point, I will, uh, we will see that uh, it fails. But at first glance, the main observations actually can be more or less uh, uh, the main behavior can be obtained using the, the theory of IID random variables. So let's see how it goes. So there is a first, first remark that probably should be relatively, uh, relatively intuitive, is that if you look at uh, the behavior of this lambda max, so of course it will be a random variable. It will fluctuate from one realization to the other of your random matrix. But when n is very large, since the largest, since you see, I mean, the support here is bounded, well, you, sh you would not naively expect that uh, this lambda max would be very close to square root of 2. OK, so that means that if you take a huge uh, matrix, then typically uh, lambda max will be as close as you want 
uh, from square root of 2. I mean, as n is large. Okay. So that means that uh, lambda max, uh, almost surely, uh, will go to square root of 2 when n goes to infinity. So that means that with probability 1, when n goes to infinity, if you look at where lambda max is, that will be in square root of 2. So that's something that we know uh, for sure if the eigenvalues here were completely uncorrelated. I mean, this is something that we have, okay, I gave you results at least for that. Now, it turns out that you can show that. So it's a theorem. I mean, it's not something that, you sh that, that it's easy to show. But that's a fact. And this fact is, at the end, uh, quite intuitive. OK, so yeah. Yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, I do not assume that they are ordered. I could do that, but that would lead to something equivalent. I divide by n such that it is normalized to 1. So it's really a PDF. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Well, I mean, if I don't do that, uh, this, this, that, will, that will give me n times the PDF of the eigenvalues without the sum. Yeah, 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 that's true. I could do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just that you're right. I could I, I could just do that. Then you, you are you're absolutely right. Sorry. Well, you, the the total weight is one. The integral of this is one. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, by definition of my density initially, d lambda rho w of lambda. Yes, you, you are right. This is one. This is one even for uh, any. So of course, you can check that this is well normalized. Now, concerning your question, you are right. Uh, the reason why we usually write it in this way is that uh, when you really want to do the computations, mm -hmm. it's much better to have an object which is completely symmetric under the different lambda i's. But you are right. I mean, that's, of course. Uh, so what, uh, what, what he suggests is that this is just equal to uh, delta of lambda minus lambda i for any i. Okay. OK, so that's basically that's what I wrote here. Hey, which, sorry. Is that clear? Yeah, that's probably a good way to see it indeed. OK, so that's uh, now the, 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 the first thing. Now, suppose that you want to know, you, you would like to know more. And we have seen that uh, in the IID case, uh, OK, knowing just the limiting value, so that would be the equivalent of a n, if you want, in our language of uh, standard. Uh, so that would be that means that a n is basically uh, equal to square root of two. So in other words, uh, for finite n, uh, one expects. Okay, I mean this is just uh, one expects. I mean, okay, I'm not. There will be a leading term, which is a n, OK, square root of 2, say. And then there would be some b n times some random, some random variable. I mean, OK, this, I'm not assuming anything here, but uh, it's just that I take the notations that we had before for iid. So now we have seen that, OK, this, this guy is just a n, OK? Again, in our previous language. So what I want, so let's let's try to to say something about this this full thing. Uh, if one assumes that these lambda i's were iid random variables, okay. So you see that if the the lambda i's were iid, we are in a case where here we have something which looks like viable. So we we, we would end up in the viable case, okay, because we have a finite support, and on top of that, it van the density vanishes as uh, a square root here. So if the lambda i's were uh, iid, essentially chi would be distributed according to some viable, uh, viable uh, type of uh, distribution, which turns out to be completely wrong. But still, uh, one can still try to say something about the scale vn. 
So if the lambda i's were iid, so again, that would be, that could corresponding to the viable case. Let's write it. So how, how do I determine bn? Well, bn, remember, I mean, we had a formula for bn, which is the following. So bn is related, in this case, to uh, basically the, the typical value. So what is the, the formula for the typical value? So here, I'm bounded at square root of 2. And then bn is such that there is essentially one eigenvalues in this, uh, in this uh, uh, That should be equal to 1 over n. OK, so that would be the formula that you get from IID. OK, that's the viable case. And we have, we have seen that there is a nice formula for it. Is that fine? Now, of course, Bn will be, one expects that Bn will be very small. So that, that interval of integration is really very close to square root of 2. So in this, in this region here, I can just replace Rho of w, okay, I can do the explicit integral if you want, but uh, I can also just replace this expression here by its asymptotic behavior close to square root of 2. Okay. Now, close to square root of 2, you see that uh, so I want to estimate Bn. Again, I know that I am a bit off the the, uh, the the realm of IID, but okay, let's let's try something. I mean, this is the only thing that we can say in principle without going to very heavy calculations. So let's do that. So rho w of lambda. I mean, you see how it behaves here. It's basically uh, okay. There is a, con a constant. Okay, you can still write this like this if you want. So it's just one over square root of pi, uh, square root of uh, square root of two minus lambda times square root of uh, square root of 2 uh, plus lambda. Okay. So if you look at how it behaves when lambda goes to square root of 2, then this is 2 square root of 2. So you have square root of 2 square root of 2 divided by pi. And times this, I don't care. But what is important is this square root behavior. OK, so when you really are close to that, I mean, you have something which vanishes as a square root. OK? So now you can replace this behavior in this integral because we expect Bn to be close, I mean, to be, to be very close to 0. So within this interval here, I can replace this guy by its asymptotic exp expansion. And uh, what you get is the following. So OK, let's just write it explicitly. So that tells you that you have this, this uh, integral here, square root of 2 minus bn times square root of 2. And you have d lambda. So you have some constant here. Let's call it, uh, let's call this a. Okay. So I have an a, which doesn't matter too much here. And then you have square root of square root of 2 minus lambda. And this is equal to 1 over n. So that's, that's this, OK? So now, when you do this integral, uh, what you will get is that, OK, there will be some constant that I want, don't want to compute. But as a function of, of bn, you immediately see that when you integrate the square root, you will get something to the power 3 by 2. And that gives you bn to the power 3 by 2 is equal to 1 over n. a prime is some number that I don't care of. And immediately, you get that bn is of order n to the power minus 2 short. OK? So that's what you would get. Uh, and this exponent is quite non-trivial. I mean, people have looked at this exponent for, for years. Uh, it turns out that you can get it uh, very simply here. This 2 third here is related to the KPZ 2 third exponent that we have seen yesterday. I will not explain why, but uh, this is the same exponent. So. This 2 third here, uh, of course, we obtained it by assuming that the lambda i's are iid. And we use this assumption. But as all the good assumptions or approximations, they hold far beyond the uh, domain of applicability. 
And it turns out that this, although in principle, okay, it's not very clear as to why I, I could uh, really apply this, uh, this, this kind of, of formula, it turns out this actually gives me the, 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 the good answer. Okay. So that's a very uh, easy, and okay, there, is, there is a reason. The reason is that the, the correlations are not strong enough to break the validity of this. Uh, and in fact, in all the matrix models that we know, uh, this is, uh, in fact, in, in, in all the models, even, even of, uh, now that's, that's probably uh, interesting to emphasize that, but in all the models that we know, uh, even of strongly correlated variables, this formula that allows you to, uh, to extract the typical value of the maximum always works. I mean, I don't know any example. It, there, is, this is, there is no proof of that. But I don't know any examples where this estimate of the typical fluctuations actually fails. So that's also why I, I started to present this. Uh, by presenting this formula when I started my lectures on IID random variables, this is probably the most robust uh, approximation that you can get out of these IID random variables. So that means that we know actually now this Bn, which is this n to the power 2 thirds. And now basically that's where the IID approximation stops, right? Because if I want to go one step further, <coughs> step further would be to say, okay, I, am, I would be in the uh, viable class. So that would be essentially the viable distribution. And this already is completely wrong. Okay. So that's uh, worth also now to, to mention that, that uh, this IID uh, statement or this IID approximation correctly predicts the scale of the fluctuations, but does not predict properly the detailed structure of uh, this random variable. Okay, so that's kind of rough approximation, which is not completely off because it gives you already the good exponent. But if you want to know more, then you have to work more. Okay. So uh, the IID uh, uh, approximation uh, correctly predicts. Okay, so maybe I can just write this here. correctly predicts, so the typical scale of fluctuations, so here this is Bn, but in general this is correctly predicts the, the scale of uh, fluctuations, uh, but not the distribution itself, okay? But not the, the chi, but not chi, okay? So we don't know what is chi, unfortunately, with that. Okay, one reason why this, why we cannot get chi with that, is that of course we are doing a very strong as assumption here. We are saying that the, the density is bounded by square root of two. So we are considering the fact where the lambda i's actually cannot exceed the value square root of two, but I told you that for finite n, of course, there will be some probability to escape far away from this big north semicircle. Okay, so you remember I did this picture here. So this is the n goes to infinity limit. And that's what I, cons I played with, okay? I, I, I replaced, here I would re really replaced its value n goes to infinity, but still having a one over n on that side. So it's a little bit inconsistent in some way. And plus, the point is that for finite n, we know that, as I, as I said, I mean, there will be some tails there, okay? some kind of leaf sheet tails, if you want to, to say it like that. I mean, some kind of tails, okay? So, of course, lambda max, in fact, have the possibility to be larger than square root of 2, okay? While if you stick to this IID case and say that they have all this uh, kind of viable distribution, this would not just be possible. So that's uh, mainly the reason why uh, this, this approximation fails. And in fact, uh, the, the, the full distribution, uh, or say the fluctuations of, of lambda max, uh, have been uh, properly uh, computed uh, 20 years ago, almost, in 94, by uh, Tracy and Widom. And I will just uh, tell you now what the results are. So the question is, uh, what is this chi random variable, okay? So again, 
we know some, some piece of this. We know square root of two. We know a and b n. Now what is chi? So again, chi uh, is given by uh, under the name of the Tracy rhythm distribution. Uh, we have heard about it yesterday uh, in this KPZ talk. Uh, and okay, this was uh, there were basically two seminal papers, one in '94, and one in '96. Uh, usually, in this random matrix case, uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble is the is the simplest one. So beta equal two is usually quite simple, and it was studied first. And beta equal one was studied later because it's it's much much harder. And in fact, it was studied with the case one equal to beta equal four also because one and four. I mean, there bear some similarities at the technical level, basically. In this case, you would have to, since we are do, dealing a bit with algebra, uh, we expect, OK, that's not a big surprise. But here, the central objects are determinants. It's basically, you have to manipulate complicated determinants. Unfortunately, in this case, you have to deal with some more complicated objects, which are called Pfaffian. Uh, and OK, you can still do things with Pfaffians. I mean, at least these guys were able to do uh, very nice things. Uh, but it's more complicated. So I will probably discuss mainly the case beta equal 2, although I will also, I mean, just to give you a bit of the flavor. So what do we know? And then uh, I will show, try to show you or to give you some interpretation of uh, how to, to compute to compute this, uh, this uh, distribution, OK? So what we want to compute is really this, uh, this, this quantity. Uh, we would like to compute basically the this, this guy, right? So this is the probability that lambda max is smaller than w. So this is, again, I mean, I will come back to this later. Uh, but uh, you remember that in the, the case of this uh, maze model, these uh, ecological uh, particles models, uh, this is just the, the stability property, right, of this. So maybe already here we can already comment on something and make a link with, with this uh, before, doing, before going to the yeah, maybe that's a good point. Maybe a uh, good way to do. Before really going to, to, to showing to you the, the Tracy rhythm distribution, let's make a small contact with the, the stability that, uh, that May was studying. OK? So just, uh, just to make contact in May's problem, a piece table of alpha is just fn of uh, of uh, one over of well, sorry, it was just a one w of equal to one over alpha. Okay. Remember that so that the probability that the system is stable is just the probability that lambda max is smaller than w. So we have already we can already answer I mean understand to some extent uh, this phase transition that May was 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 observing because you see that f n of w is a cumulative distribution so it's basically zero. It's in between 0 and 1. So if I plot, uh, if I plot uh, this guy, fn of w as a function of w, well, we have seen that you see that it will have typically this shape, right? We understand now that it will have this shape because uh, it's well, it's a, obviously it's a cumulative distribution. So that that's that's. Uh, fairly easy to understand. So this is 1, this is 0. So if w is very small, then the probability that lambda max is very small is also very small. This probability is also very small. On the other hand, if w is very large, the probability that lambda max is smaller than a very large number, okay, it's, this probability will be almost 1. Now, what we have seen here uh, is that in the limit when n goes to infinity, Lambda max is essentially equal to square root of 2. So it asymptotically, I mean, almost surely it will be square root of 2. So in other words, that means that uh, this value here, so if I really look at what happens at n goes to infinity, uh, actually, this cumulative distribution will be a very sharp step, step function. And the, the value that you have here is precisely, uh, is precisely square root of 2. Yes, yes, because here, so uh, at the moment, we cannot say more about the nature of the transition. I mean, 
this is there is a transition, but we don't say anything about the 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 the, the nature of this transition. Okay, so in principle, uh, to go further, so I realized that I, I what I wrote yesterday probably was a bit. Uh, I wrote W is equal to 1 over square root of 2, actually. I, I, I was wrong. Actually, it's alpha which is equal to 1 over square root of 2. I mixed up uh, uh, alpha and, and W. But that's the correct picture. So now, if you want to say something about the nature of the transition, yeah, you need to go further. I mean, you need to, to, to say more about, essentially, about the free energies in the two phases. Okay. Now, the free energies of what is not yet clear, but maybe uh, I will just uh, write it. Uh, uh, in a moment. So that's basically the free energy associated to this model. Okay. So, um, so that's the May transition. Okay. So now we understand at least why he observes something. Uh, something. Uh, so this is the limit n goes to infinity. And again, at least we have already uh, something about the May transition. Okay. Very nice. Now, let's. Write maybe and try to write why this fn of w is, and maybe we already we will just sort of try or begin to 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 understand that this phase transition is really associated to some thermodynamic phase transition because if I write fn of w, so this is the probability again that all the eigenvalues are less than w. But so that means that I want all the eigenvalues. Uh, so I want to have lambda 1 smaller than w, lambda 2 smaller than w, lambda n smaller than w. OK? So what is that? Well, I can write it explicitly, actually, because I know the joint distribution of these lambda i's. And so I just need to integrate this joint law from minus infinity to w. So that's just formally that that should be written like this. So I would have W of the, the joint law of lambda 1, lambda n. Is that OK? And this is, again, let me write it. Now we have a sort of statistical physics interpretation of this, because this joint law is, is actually a Boltzmann weight associated to McCoolon gas. Agreed? So you remember that these are, this is just the Boltzmann weight associated to uh, particles which are sitting on a real line, confined in a quadratic potential, and interacting repulsively via the logarithmic potential. But now there is a new ingredient. This new ingredient is that these particles actually have to stay between this. They cannot live on the, all the real line, but now they are bounded to stay between minus infinity and w. So in other words, I have now my, one has to think about it in this way. So I have this collection of particles. They live in this quadratic potential. So they are there. They are interacting. But now I am imposing something else. I am imposing that they cannot be on the right side of this place. So I would like to think of this model as a Coulomb gas with a wall. OK, so I have an impenetrable wall here. And my particles actually cannot, they just cannot, um, cannot go to the right of it. So my particles are bounded uh, here to stay uh, on this, on this uh, semi-axis here. So as you can imagine, I mean, if I push them, that will sort of, there will be some crowding effects close to the wall. Well, if you are far away, you don't feel too much the wall. But uh, what you are saying is that, what you are seeing on this on this model is that, again, this cumulative distribution, which is something which is in principle a complete mathematical object, again, is just the partition function. So that's just the partition function. Okay, forget about this. So this is the ratio of two partition functions, but this is just the partition function 
of a Coulomb gas in presence of a wall. Okay? And now you see what is happening. So you have your control parameter is W. So it's like the temperature if you want in the Ising model. I mean, you have an external parameter. Here, this is W. It's a kind of pressure. Right? It's the pressure that you exert that you exert on your uh, on your on your gas here. And what you see is that okay, this is Fn of W. So Fn of W, we know it's just the partition function here. So we already anticipate that the better object would be to look at the log of this, or minus log of this. Okay, because Fn being a partition function, minus log of Fn will be uh, the free energy. And that's usually the good example, I mean, the good object uh, to look at. And from the minus log of Fn of W, we would be able to see or to identify the nature of the transition. OK? So that's, that, that, that's the idea. So again, what, is, what I like in, this, in this, this setup here, and I think which is quite interesting, is that you see that you have initially a, a, a problem which is in principle of pure, purely probabilistic nature. Uh, but you have eventually translated it in a, in a quite physical language. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, yes. So now, uh, what do I do with that? <laughs> okay. So I just uh, maybe. Uh, uh, okay. That's fine. Let's do that like this. So now uh, I want to tell you what uh, what we know about it and what happens in the large n limit. Okay, so there is, uh, as we said, as I said, uh, there is something happening close to square root of two here, uh, and I want uh, now to comment uh, and be more specific on what these guys Tracy and Riedel have shown. So what these uh, gentlemen uh, have shown is that. Uh, you can write explicitly this uh, this distribution, so I will be brief because okay, it's a little bit technical and mathematical, but still it's nice to see it. I think. Uh, so again, what we know is that lambda max, uh, we we have seen it is square root of two plus uh, n to the power of minus two third times uh, some uh, distribution here. Now this distribution I will call T W because of these guys, Tracy and Widon, they are mathematicians. Uh, and usually to define it, okay, it's better to have, uh, I will let me introduce a square root of two here. Okay, it's just a matter of definition. Now it turns out that this, uh, this uh, the distribution of chi of TW, it has an explicit expression. Um, and maybe uh, I can just, uh, yeah, let me just uh, give some, um, some details, not, not details, but uh, let's, let's show it. So for beta equal 1 to 4, at least, uh, it's possible to, to compute explicitly uh, the probability distribution of chi of Tw. So I can compute the probability that chi of Tw is, say, smaller than x. And it has a fairly explicit expression, and uh, OK. There is a first way, so if I look at beta equal 1, at 2, for instance, beta equal 2, which is the simpler case, in principle, this distribution can be written in what is known under the name of uh, Fredholm determinants. Uh, for 1 and 4, in terms of Fredholm Fafians, I will not uh, show you. I don't want to frighten you, so I will not show you these this formulas. Um, but it turns out that uh, in many cases, so in, in these three cases, they have an alternative uh, expression, and that's actually um, what was uncovered by uh, Tracy Ridon is that uh, they can be expressed in terms of the solution of some equations. And okay, if, if you have, if you remember a little bit of, I mean, or if you have studied that, maybe I'll just tell you this. <clears throat> when you classify the, the second order differential equations, ordin ordinary differential equations, there is a classification which is due to Panlevé, um, which was a French mathematician. He was also a politician, actually, but quite bad politician, but uh, a good mathematician. But <laughs> so he actually classified uh, the, uh, the, 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 the second order differential equations uh, with respect to the singularity that they may exhibit. And among them, that there is, so they, they have numbers. Uh, and there is the second one, which is uh, now quite well known because, because of this. So you, you, you take a function q of s, which is basically a solution of this, of this uh, equation. Uh, so it's quite nonlinear. So it's, there is no explicit expression, if you want, 
uh, for this, so this solution, it's quite explicit. Okay, so this is uh, your equation. Now, to specify it, uh, you only need to specify its behavior for large s, and for large s, it has to behave well. If you know a bit of special function, this is nice, otherwise it doesn't matter. This is just to, to show you. Okay, so for large s, basically this term goes to zero, and you need to solve this equation. Q, Q double prime is equal to SQS, and this is actually the solution of this equation is just what is known under the name of the area function. Now, once you know this equation, okay, no matter. Uh, once you know this this equation, then basically you can compute uh, you can compute uh, the uh, the for beta equal one to four. You can get explicitly this 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 function here, this trace rhythm distribution, as an integral of this of this thing. Okay, just to give you the flavor, I just give you because it's the simplest for beta equal two, and then I just stop with this. Uh, type of things, uh, which I like very much, but OK, which is not. Uh, OK, this, I don't know, maybe, maybe there are some of you who have worked a bit on integrable systems. This, this Panlevé equations actually uh, are very important in the realm of integrable systems. So uh, F2 of x, as I said, is just exponential. Of, it's just to show you that there is some explicit expression, ds x minus s, q square of s. OK, so you first need to solve this equation. I mean, suppose that you want to do it numerically. You can solve this equation numerically. It's pretty simple. And then you inject it, and you get whatever you want. So OK, it's a bit formal. But what is interesting is that you can get the asymptotic behaviors. And it turns out that this function, so that, that's one can actually look at the distribution of f beta and to see how, I mean, how it looks a little bit, right? How is it close to something like a, uh, a Gaussian that we know, or something that? Uh, so let's look at the asymptotic behavior of this of this quantity. And let me just uh, tell you what they are. So if you look at very negative x, I just I just want to show you that it is quite an asymmetric function. And when x goes to minus infinity, so it behaves like so it's quite non-Gaussian on the left. Okay. So it, it behaves like exponential minus beta over 12. I don't know. No, 24. Beta over 24. For x goes to minus infinity. And if you look at how it behaves for x going to, in, to plus infinity, it's on top of that, it's also quite asymmetric. And it behaves like minus 2 beta over 3 times x to the power 3 by 2. So I just, I will not, uh, I will not. Uh, probably comment too much on this, except to say that they have a, a quite asymmetric tails, and it's clearly non-Gaussians. Okay, so it's highly non-Gaussians, non-Gaussian tails. Sorry. Uh, this guy. So this is a function f. Okay, sorry. So I'm saying, yeah, maybe I was a bit a bit fast. So. Okay, so the, the, the statement is as follows, okay? So you have this lambda max. So in the large n limit, this goes to a deterministic value, square root of 2. And then there are some small fluctuations, which are of the order n to the power of minus 2 third. And they are given by this, this guy here, chi. Okay? Now, what is this chi? So chi is a random variable, which, is, which does not depend on n. And the cumulative distribution of chi is given by f beta. That means that it depends on the parameter beta that we have seen before, right? This beta, beta equal 1 for GOE, beta equal 2 for GUE, etc. So, OK, I just wanted to, to show you an example uh, and tell you the simplest case, which is already a bit complicated, but, but still explicit. So if you look at beta equal 2, in fact, 1, 2, and 4, you can express this f beta as the, uh, a specific a particular solution of a, an ordinary differential equation, which is called here a Panlevé equation. It's a Panlevé 2 equation. Now, for beta equal 2, so this is this function for beta equal 2. It can be written as this integral. OK, this integral of this. So you need to know the, the function q of s, which is the solution of that horrible equation. OK? And now, I'm looking at f prime beta, 
which is the PDF, okay? So why I'm, I'm, I'm doing F prime beta? Because F beta, you see, is the cumulative distribution. And, okay, I usually prefer to look at the PDF because otherwise it's a bit. Is that okay? So now F prime beta, you can show, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's more than an exercise, actually. Uh, but you can show that it has this, uh, these tails. I just want to, sh to show you this because, of course, I mean, when you see this formula here, probably it doesn't tell you anything. Uh, but on the other hand, and that's why it's always very useful to know the, the asymptotic behaviors of, of a PDF, right? Because if you have an, an explicit expression like that, okay, it's very useful to evaluate it numerically or to, to plot it, but at some point you want to, to see uh, how it looks like, right? So since I cannot really show you the, the, the plot of it, um, I prefer to be a bit more quantitative and show you the asymptotic behavior of this distribution, okay? which are actually very precise already, so that they describe quite well the tails. So it behaves like exponential minus mod x cube from, for x negative and large, and it has this x to the power, exponential minus x to the power 3 by 2 for large, for large positive x. Okay, so it's pretty non-Gaussian. It's also quite asymmetric. So Gaussian would be just x squared. So none of the tails actually are of that form. And on top of that, they are quite asymmetric. Okay, so it's, this, is, this is how they look like. Okay. So now, uh, I guess um, that I want to, I mean, okay, that's, that's, um, That's something that I want to, 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 to show you. So this was this uh, Tracy Rhythm distribution. And this has to, this has to deal with, the, with I want, what I want to, to, to name uh, or to call. I have to, have to do with the typical fluctuations. Now, somewhat unfortunately, uh, if you want to understand a little bit more this May transition, uh, you need to go beyond these typical fluctuations. And what you would like to understand is what happens uh, when you have large deviations uh, of lambda max. That means when lambda max is very far away from square root of 2. So by this, I mean the following. Oh, by the way, I mean, if you, are, if you want really to think already about it, this, this QB here uh, is the indication of this third order phase transition. Okay, it's, it's still a bit hidden, but, but th this, is, this is what it is. So. So now I want to comment on, so as I said, to, to understand better this, uh, this, this part of the, I mean, to understand better the, the, these May transitions, uh, one needs to go further and to study the large deviations of lambda max. So this is something that we have not studied too much up to now. So I just want uh, to comment on that. So. Let me give the motivation for it, and then, uh, so okay. So the, I, I, like, I like the following picture. Uh, you look at your eigenvalues. I have here the, the density, minus square root of 2 plus square root of 2, okay? And I was actually telling you of this uh, Tracy and Widom, what they tell us, and this is also what we got with our argument, that if you look at lambda max, actually the, 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 the scale of the distribution that we have studied is very narrow around square root of 2, right? Because the scale is of order n to the power minus 2 third. So we are looking at, we are describing the fluctuations on a very small scale around square root of 2. So typically, I will plot, so this is the density of eigenvalue. On the same plot, I'm plotting the density of eigenvalue and the PDF of lambda max. Okay, so this is this is it. So this has something like this. This is basically this uh, this, this distribution that we have studied here. Okay, so that's Tracy Widom. But you see, I mean, Tracy Widom is very nice, but unfortunately, it's also restricted to a very narrow narrow scale. Okay, and in particular. It doesn't tell you anything on how the things behave here. Lambda max, you see, I mean, lambda max in principle can be anywhere. It can be zero, for instance. So what, how, do, how would you describe this state here? Very far away from square root of 2. Even down to minus square root of 2, if I want to. Minus infinity, in principle. Okay, so this regime here 
are called, so you, you, you have to see that, for instance, a natural question could be, what's the probability that all the eigenvalues are negative? It's a natural question, I mean. That means, what's the probability that lambda max is smaller than zero? So you see that you are very far away from square root of two, typically of order one. So it turns out that this regime here of large deviations, that's what I call large deviations. Uh, so this is the large deviations of lambda max. So this is the left, left from some obvious reason. And it turns out that these large, left large deviations are not described by Tracy Reader. Okay? They are described by some, some, something else, by, large, by some large deviation regime, some large deviation functions that we would need to compute to say something on that regime. But this Tracy Reader doesn't tell you anything about it. OK, I mean, it's, it's just uh, they are crossing here, but it's just uh, purely incidental. I mean, it's not that point. Yeah. Yes. Well, here I didn't show you really the computation of it. So uh, uh, they are, of course, you are assuming actually that, uh, so when you do this computation, so essentially what, what you show is that uh, I want to compute this Fn, this Fn, okay? So I wrote it as square root of two plus, as I said, basically, uh, one over square root of two. I mean, that's the way you would do the computation. And to the power minus two third times s. Okay, so that, that, that's my variable chi. And this actually goes, when n goes to infinity, this converges in the sense of distribution, blah, blah, blah. This converges to f beta of s. Okay, so that's somehow the approximation that I did. It's, well, it's not an approximation. This is, this is the statement, okay? But that really tells you that uh, you see that you are only looking at the fluctuations, which are of the order n to the power minus 2, sir. Okay. And obviously, what you will see is that, uh, that is true, is that when we, when we will look at the, the, the left large deviations and right large deviations, that means that if I take another scale for s, so suppose that I take s equal to 1 here, I mean of order 1, then that's, formally it will go to 0. But zero doesn't tell you so much. I mean, uh, you would like to see really how, how much, how small it, it is. And uh, you enter a so-called large deviation regime, and which has a specific form, which I will describe in a minute. And what does it mean when the is going either to Well, here that means that basically, okay, so that means that in minus infinity means that you are touching here this, this regime here. Okay, so you are approaching this regime, okay? But still of order n to the power minus 2 thirds. So that means that s, s is large, but still you have to remind that you are in a, in a regime of order n to the power minus 2 thirds. Okay. And the same, you could ask also what's the probability that the, 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 the distribution is very far on the right, right? I mean, uh, that's also a legitimate question. Again, so that would be the right large deviation. And unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but there is more than Tracy rhythm in this problem. Uh, and this is the right, right large deviation. So you would like to know, uh, you would like to know more uh, about, about this, this one. So I don't know how much familiar you are uh, with these large deviations, uh, but I thought maybe it could be nice to show you some before illustrating on the Tracy rhythm, which is a bit involved. Let's maybe look at some large deviation problems on very simple system. Except if every one of you is very familiar to large deviations, otherwise I will just uh, immediately go, I mean, uh, and continue on that. But uh, how many of you have, are quite familiar with large deviations? Okay, 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 so let's, Okay, let's do it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry for you guys. Uh, um, but uh, okay, I will uh, just try to, uh, to to illustrate it on a on a very simple. Uh, you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, on, on on a simple simple problem, probably the, the simplest simplest example, which is a coin tossing example. Okay, I mean it's quite 
quite simple, but just to illustrate to our large deviations is because otherwise uh, you, you will be really get bored with what I will say. I mean, and that will just mean anything, not mean anything for you. So, uh, it's just a very uh, reminder on large deviations. Uh, okay, so in fact, uh, it's the large deviations for the sum of IID random variables. And I, okay, so let's consider the simple, simple game. Just a coin tossing problem. So uh, with probability half, uh, you will uh, you will have a head. With probability half, that will be h. And uh, with probability with probability half, you will have tail. Okay. So just do some coin tossing experiments, and uh, you do it uh, n times. Okay. So you have n trials. And after n trials, uh, you count the number of heads that you had. Okay. So why is it related to the sum of IID? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, this will be, so if you do n trials, uh, let me introduce uh, an, indicator, an indicator function, sigma i, which is essentially like a spin variable, which is 0 or 1 depending on whether you had a, so is one if you have a, if you have head, and this is zero if you have tail. Okay? So NH is obviously is just the sum of random variables. Okay? So what you want to do, obviously, so it's, it will be a random number, and you want to compute, say, the probability that NH is equal to, say, a given value, say, m. Right? So this is something that uh, you can compute easily. This is just a combinatorial factor divided by the total number of possibilities, which is 1 over 2 to the n. Okay? So this is just n choose m, and you divide by n uh, by this. Okay. That should be okay. Nice. So of course, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Now, once you have this, uh, you can compute various statistics of NH. For instance, you can compute the, the average value. The average value is very simple. The average value, obviously, you don't need any computation. It will be just n by 2. And you can also compute the variance, which requires a bit of computation, but can compute sigma h square, which will be nh square minus nh square. And it's a small computation that to show that this is n, n, n over 4. Okay. So now we know from the central limit theorem that the typical fluctuations of NH will be given by a Gaussian distribution around its mean. Okay? So, okay, let's forget our friends here for a while, or probably until, until Monday. <coughs> so, the the typical fluctuations are given by, so that's, ni that's nice to, to have in mind that this is the typical fluctuation. These are the typical fluctuations. I will come this, I mean, you will see in a minute uh, what I mean. So we know that they will be given by the central limit theorem. Okay, so that means that, uh, that's what I mean by typical fluctuations, are given by the central limit theorem, CLT, okay? So what does it mean? It means that this probability NH of M in the large N limit, it will reach a Gaussian form around the mean value N by 2 and with some variance sigma square. You, you don't like this? Yeah. 
it should be what sorry why do you want to have it n over 4 n square no no because it is the sigma h okay sigma h will be square root of n right so that's the central limit theorem right, right? so so you would expect Right, because uh, you see, I mean, I have, this is the variance, so I have subtracted the, the leading term. Okay, the leading term of this will be n squared by four, but it will be cancelled by this, right? N squared by four. Is that okay? So what is uh, what is that? So again, this is, this this will be a Gaussian. So let's write it explicitly. This will be one over square root of two over pi n exponential of minus two over n times m minus n over 2 square. OK? So that's, that's fair enough. And we know that it describes very well the, the typical fluctuations around n by 2. Now let's look at, so let's look at a rare event. So OK, what I mean, what do I mean by fluctuations? You see that the fluctuations here are typically of order square root of n, okay, because, because of this. So typical fluctuations. Okay, maybe I just will do the same drawing that I did before. We have this. So M is positive. So this is P this is this quantity as a function of M. Okay? And so what I'm saying is that here it's very nice. I have this 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 explicit uh, expression, which is that. This is a Gaussian. It should be perfectly symmetric. And this is of order square root of n. So these are the typical fluctuations. I'm, I'm claiming that these are the typical fluctuations. Why so? Why to see that, let's go to very left to n over 2. Let's consider, for instance, the probability that m is equal to 0. This will be some event, possible event, right? What's the probability for that? Well, it's very simple probability that m is equal, sorry, that nh, excuse me, that nh is equal to 0, this is what? This is 1 over 2 to the power, 1 over 2 to the power n, right? Because I will just, that means that I obtain tails uh, every time, OK? Now, if you evaluate this formula for nh equal to, for m equal to 0, what you see here is that, uh, if you evaluate it for m at m equal to 0, uh, it gives you, OK, forget about this. OK, we can put it if you, if you like, but I won't need it. And then I will get what? I will get exponential of minus. So m is 0, so I have n squared by 4. So that's minus n by 2. Now here, obviously, this is exponential of minus n log 2. So obviously, this formula cannot hold up to that, up to that point. So in other words, that means that this regime here is only, uh, so again, this is different from the exact result. One over two to the n. And so that tells you that this regime here can only has a limited uh, domain of validity, which we expect which is of order square root of n. And if you go to, now, if m instead is of order n, if you have, a, or if you really are at a distance of order n from n by 2, then you will enter a different regime. Okay, so we have another regime here and another regime there. Now, the question is, what is this regime? So that's, that's a large deviation. That's what is called large deviation. Okay, so when you are very far away from the, from the typical value, uh, you will face uh, another regime which is not described by the Gaussian. The question is by, I mean, what, what is the good approximation or what is the form of the distribution? Now, it turns out that um, in this case, so now if you start from this formula, it turns out that the large deviation regime uh, is in fact This is easy to get, actually, from the 
So let's look at the case where basically uh, I want to have it turns out that the large deviation regime I can just have it. So I'm just writing that M, I just write it of this form. Okay, so I want to have M to be of order to be of order N, and that means M will be C, sorry, will be in between zero and one. Now, if you do that uh, in this limit, and if you play with a Stirling, Stirling formula, it's, it's, it's a fairly simple exercise to show that in the large n limit, uh, this will be of that form, exponential of minus n times some function of c, phi of c. <clears throat> Again, from, from that formula, I mean, you just need to take the large n limit of this uh, combinatorial factor, and this phi of c, okay, it's, it's, I'm sure you have seen uh, several times. Uh, it has uh, a relatively, uh, relatively simple expression. You can compute it here explicitly here. So it's just c log c plus 1 minus c. It's kind of entropy. And you have a, a con an addition here because, because, yeah, because you have uh, log of 2. Okay. So now this form is very nice. This form is very nice because, for instance, if you compute phi of zero, phi of zero, you really co recover the, the, the exact result. Right? If you compute this uh, in particular, which is this exact result. Sorry, log of two. Now, Sorry, yeah. I don't understand. Um, why the temporal limit appearance failing in um, the limit of uh, say, A and you know, because uh, Yeah, because. No, that, that, what it means is that this uh, Gaussian form, it only describes pretty well the fluctuations around n over 2 on a scale of order square root of n. But if you go beyond that, that means if you ask for some probability of m far from n over 2, which are of order n, say when you put m equals 0, then the distance is of order n, is n by 2, much larger than square root of n, then this regime is not correct anymore. Well, this. In the central limit theorem, you are assuming that you are looking at the fluctuations around square root of n. So that's the same as before. So if you really, yeah, you, so that means that the central limit theorem tells you basically that if you do p of uh, n by 2 plus, uh, say, x square root of n, okay, then this will go to the Gaussian. Okay, when n goes to infinity. A bit like in the Tracy Widom case that I mentioned. But obviously, if you don't scale the things like that, something happens, something different happens. Of course, and I will show you it in a minute, and this is also nice in this case, the large deviation regime actually encodes also the central, the, 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 expon the, the, the Gaussian part. So that means that if you look at this distribution around the minimum, it has a quadratic behavior which precisely encodes the, the, this, this guy here. So if you look at, uh, so now that, that comes what, what, what I wanted to say, is that if you look at phi of c as a function of c, so it's on 0, 1, uh, it's symmetric around half for some obvious reason, and it goes like that, right? So phi of 0 is log 2, phi of 1, for the same reason phi of 1 is also is also is also uh, log two, so you go to log two, go to log two, so you have something non-trivial here. And around around this point here, around this point is the central limit theorem. Okay, so that's that's the Gaussian behavior. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at this function 
close to half, it behaves like c minus half square. And there is a prefactor here. Maybe it's good to give it. If I want to stick, uh, I don't know. Yes, let's do it properly. It's two. OK, so now let's, so what I'm saying is that this form here is, is very nice because, uh, so in other words, you have, yeah, if I would, maybe you, you have to remember that C is, so this is the last, so this has typically this, this kind of thing. OK, so this is really of that form. OK, so now let's, let's see that uh, explicitly that this large deviation regime actually also encodes the Gaussian. So it has, it has much more because it has the large deviation form, but it encodes also the, 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 the Gaussian, the Gaussian peak. Okay, so let's see it. And I guess if I have time, okay, I have a uh, few minutes, but that's what I need. I mean, a few minutes, I see I have one minute, but uh, I will need maybe two or three minutes. So, so what I'm saying is that this form here, uh, and codes more, more. So the, 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 the quadratic form will be something like that, right? So, so the, the, the osculating parabola, if you want, uh, probably something like this. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the parabola. So now let's look at what we had before. That means that suppose that from that formula, let's look at, let's look at it under this form. Uh, I will uh, look at it like this. So you remember that, uh, right. So you remember what? You remember that NH was N by 2, and we have sigma uh, H, which was square root of N by 4. OK, so that, that, that's, that, that's what I showed you. So now let's look at uh, this distribution. If I set probability that NH is precisely of this form, is basically N over 2 plus sigma H times some number X. OK, so maybe let's do it this way. So it's basically what, what, I, said, what I said before, roughly speaking. OK, so this will be of that form, right? This will be of the form exponential of minus n phi of what? Phi of m divided by n. So that means n over 2 plus square root of n by 4 times x divided by n. OK, so I, I'm just taking for granted this uh, large deviation form there. And when I have inserted m, which is n by 2 plus whatever. So now you see that. Uh, OK, it's nice. It's of that form, exponential phi. So I have half. Half plus what? Plus uh, 1 over square root of 4n x. OK. Oh, excuse me. There is an n here. Is that OK? And now I just use the fact that uh, I, I want to, to make a Taylor uh, expansion of this function around 1 half, right? Because this term is small. So I can just use the, this behavior. OK? So let's do it. So if I do it, you immediately see that you will get exponential of minus n times what? Times c minus half square. So c minus half is just this term here. So that's 1 over square root of 4n times x squared, and I have a factor of 2 here, 2. OK? Now, if you combine anything, everything, what you find is that, of course, the n dependence goes away. n divided by square root of n squared, so the n dependence goes away. That's what you want. And here you get 2 divided by 4, so this is half. So you get exactly your Gaussian exponential minus x squared over 2. Okay? So this large deviation regime here encodes the, also captures 
the Gaussian fluctuations up to a prefactor. You will notice that I don't get here the one over square root of two pi sigma, because of course, I mean, uh, I can only get the things. I did this uh, computation at the at the level of the exponential. Uh, I mean, these are just logarithmic equivalent. Okay, so I don't get the the, the, the prefactors here, but at least uh, you get uh, you get this uh, this uh, quadratic behavior, and that's the Gaussian behavior, and that's the Gaussian that you get from the CLT. up to the prefactor. OK, so yeah, I wanted to show you this example. I, I find it uh, it's fairly simple, but it's also rather instructive. I think it explains relatively well what the uh, large deviations are. Uh, they usually play also quite an important role in extreme statistics. And we will see uh, later on, OK, next time I will show you. I mean, of course, I will not show you all the details, but I will show you a bit um, what are the large deviations for the largest uh, eigenvalue of random matrices, and what kind of information one can extract regarding this uh, this May model, this uh, ecological model that I started with? Okay, yeah, you had a question. Uh, yes, you can view it like this. You mean uh, for general problem of statistical mechanics? Well, in general, OK, these, these functions are quite, um, quite non-universal. So for instance, uh, if I, um, okay, you could ask the same question. So here, I was looking at the sum of random variables. You could have asked me, OK, uh, let's take, uh, for instance, the sum of uh, IID random variables with some initial distribution p of x. Then usually, I mean, uh, this large deviation function will be quite non-universal, will depend on p of x. Only its behavior here will be locally, I mean, the, the quadratic behavior near the minimum will be the same. This is just the result of the central limit theorem. But the tails here will be quite, will, will depend on, on many things. Now, usually, uh, you can obtain them via a saddle point calculation. And this is basically some Legendre transform of uh, some generating function that you, that you, that you can compute. So basically, in that case, this is typically the, the this is the Legendre transform of the generating function uh, of the well the, the rate function that enters in the in the in the generating function. And that that's usually the way you, you you can get it. So again, I mean here I didn't want to make a, a full course on large deviations. Uh, I just wanted to give you the flavor of what it is, how important it is, um, already on simple models, and I will then uh, later so next time. Uh, I will show you how it works for the largest eigenvalues and see you how one can uncover the order of this transition and find the third order phase transition. Uh, okay, so with this, uh, I will uh, leave you and see you on Monday then. Yeah. Higher the momentum? Sorry? Okay. So, so, in this case, uh, the, for the large deviation case, it is not difficult.